Hello and welcome. I am Ajaz Heather, and you are watching Indus Special. Our top story today is the failure of Russia, Turkey, and Iran talks in setting up a Syrian Constitutional Committee at a meeting in the Kazakh capital Astana. The UN Special Envoy Stefan de Mistura deeply regretted that there was no tangible progress in overcoming the 10-month stalemate on the composition of the Constitutional Committee, and he said this was the last occasion of an Astana meeting in 2018 and has sadly for Syrian people been a missed opportunity to accelerate the establishment of a credible, balanced and inclusive Syrian-owned, Syrian-led, UN-facilitated constitutional committee." Unquote. The UN says that Syrians look to the United Nations to facilitate a genuine, credible and inclusive process to end the conflict. The constitutional committee is a first step and will comprise three groups, the government of Syria, a broad opposition delegation, and one comprising Syrian experts, civil society independents, tribal leaders, and women. The September Russia-Turkey agreement on creating a demilitarized zone in Idlib, Idlib to facilitate the civilians there has also come under share with artillery exchanges and air attacks by government forces. To discuss the situation and figure out what possibly lies ahead, we speak with Hinar Babani Khar, who is a former foreign minister of Pakistan, and Obeda Hitu, who is a Syrian affairs expert and a journalist based in Istanbul. Uh, welcome to the program. Uh, let me kick off with Ms. Khar. Uh, when you were the foreign minister, what exactly was the Pakistan policy in relation to the conflict in Syria? That's a very interesting question, Jaz, because as you were going through what is happening right now, and as I have, of course, been following how the Syrian situation has uh, at first unraveled and then seemed to get to the point that it is at today, it seems that uh, the stance that Pakistan took at that time, uh, much to the dismay of many of uh, our friends, including the Americans and the Saudis and the Turks also, has been vindicated. Because uh, the position that Pakistan took at that time, that uh, intervention and uh, ar arming uh, any groups which were at that time called opposition groups, um, and as you remember, there was a Friends of Syria forum which was created where all the Western and many of the Middle Eastern countries were active participants, and there was immense pressure on Pakistan to join that group. And at that time, we had maintained that uh, creating this uh, and intervening in this fashion in this fashion, in an overt, uh, trying to get um, uh, external actors to become more active, uh, both on the ground and diplomatically, will only worsen the situation. And we happen to find ourselves at, uh, you know, uh, you know, at, at not a very popular place at that time, because if you remember, that was the time right after and right in the midst of the Arab Spring, etc. Uh, but our assessment at that time was, and I give a lot of credit to President Zadari, by the way, uh, because he was, uh, I think, uh, very clear in his assessment also. Um, and our assessment at that time was that uh, uh, intervening too much, uh, both at the diplomatic and at the ground level, will only worsen the situation. And we saw this worsening of situation at a level that none of us could have imagined. We saw but lots how, of how exactly we saw were we looking at the situation in terms of the opposition to uh, President uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, the political opposition, and obviously then the situation deteriorated and uh, the political opposition uh, sort of went on to become armed resistance with a number of groups thrown in. Of course. Look, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a very, uh, actually it's not a very thin line, but there's a clear demarcation uh, or a clear line from which you cross, uh, you know, from where... A, a genuinely political, indigenous, internal political opposition. And of course, there's no denying the fact that Bashar al-Assad had a dictatorial power and used them immensely and wrongly. Uh, I, I do not want to uh, justify any the excessive means that he used at all. Uh, so when that degenerates into a gameplay between uh, various external powers, uh, Western uh, and Middle Eastern, uh, and becomes almost a proxy war, which this, the Syria situation did. We saw Turkey, countries like Turkey, really change their position where they were intensively engaging with Russia and 
you know the first family of Turkey and the first family of Syria happened to vacation together, etc. Uh, yes. So for them to come to the level where they were so directly opposing, and it became a question of. Uh, never allowing Bashar al-Assad to remain. Uh, so it became a power of regime, uh, question of regime change. And in that quest for regime change, we lost many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands. But of were we engaged so, with Riyadh and Ankara and, of course, uh, Damascus and Tehran? I mean, uh, were we uh, talking to them about where the situation was going? Uh, uh, it does, you, may, you may not wish to recall, but I remember very clearly because we worked very hard for it, we were actually at that time elected members of the Security Council. And this is one of the rare occasions where Pakistan was able to get itself elected as a member of the Security Council. Actually, not so rare occasion, but those times were particularly different because we were not so friendly towards the United States at that time. Salala had just happened, OBL had just happened, and we still uh, were able to get ourselves elected. So you can imagine as a member of the Security Council with a vote, of course a non veto vote, on the Council, our, uh, our, uh, our, you know, we were quite sought after. So clearly, we were in very, very close consultation with Ankara, uh, in uh, fairly close consultation, of course, with Iran also, and of course, with the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But as I said, uh, our, our point of view was very uh, distinct and different. We were perhaps not aligned towards the Iranian point of view, but the Iranian point of view also was, of course, that intervention, etc., should not happen. So we found ourselves... Uh, to be uh, pursuing a, a, a course which we charted out for ourselves. And that's why I find it very difficult when foreign ministers of today or and ever come to uh, talk about the pressures that we're under. Because I think if you demarcate what is best for your country, and we always believe that Pakistan, had in, uh, Pakistan did not want to have a foreign policy which was trying to fix a, you know, a lot of these things uh, where more trouble could be on the way. And uh, we did not want to side with anyone uh, at all. And we started out our own course and remained on there. But who uh, did we consider we did as the legitimate representative of Syria? And by extension, I mean of the people of Syria. Look, we believe that Bashar al-Assad had uh, dealt with his people very high-handedly. Mm -hmm. And we believed that diplomatic channels should still be used to, remain, to make him remain part of the international system by, you know, uh, taking him out of the international system, you were actually empowering him further to be even more high-handed or heavy-handed with his people. So we did not believe uh, foolishly and utopianly, as we later found out, like many of our other friends, both in the Middle East uh, and in the Western world, who believed that they could arm-twist uh, him by uh, feeding opposition. And I know accounts of countries putting in a lot of money to armed groups Within Syria, so having gone through the Taliban situation in Pakistan uh, to, during the Soviet invasion uh, of Afghanistan and our reaction to it and the American uh, and the U.S.'s reaction to it and Saudi Arabia's reaction to it, etc., we've lived through that. So we knew that armed opposition or arming and fueling and giving arms and ammunition to entities which were opposing uh, the in whatever form was the current government is never a good idea for the people of that country. Okay, so uh, we, uh, we wanted the situation to be dealt with through negotiations that Bashar al-Assad should be able to talk to the opposition groups. Uh, initially, that was possible, but when the situation deteriorated and it became an armed resistance, uh, then obviously it was not possible for that kind of thing to happen. So how did we view the situation then? Being, uh, being created, right? Because we, know then, we knew then and we know now that a lot of these countries have their own interests. Uh, okay, there's a geostrategic game being played and uh, every country has immense interest in that. We wanted to, uh, we were obviously a minority and we wanted it to be viewed from, uh, away from that uh, gameplay. Uh, and therefore, we, uh, at that time, once the deterioration had happened and it was not possible, uh, then, as you remember, there was a uh, minus special asset formula where uh, almost all the other countries started saying that there can be no negotiation till the time Bashar al-Assad doesn't leave. It was, so it's real politics. It was quite obvious that Bashar al-Assad was not likely to leave, right? Now, interestingly, uh, Izaz, uh, because you say that when, you, when, when we saw that it was not possible, and now you see a position where countries like Turkey have taken in some ways what our Prime Minister takes very often, which was 
you know, I wouldn't call it a complete Imran Khan U-turn. But they are engaging with uh, Bashar al-Assad, where they said they will not be engaging with him at all. So, you know, the reality of a country, of the geography of a country, uh, the dynamics, uh, the regional dynamics, all come into play. Now, it's a big balancing act. It's very, very, uh, I can't say it's very tough, but it is a, a very uh, sensitive balancing act. You, you, you should be able to see what you consider to be likely win. So what you think is not possible to achieve I don't think it's a smart choice. So when President Obama said that uh, they will not be engaging with Bashar al-Assad and they will not be, and Syria uh, with Bashar al-Assad is not acceptable to them, well, where is his position right now? Because the U.S. is also engaging in some sort of negotiations on all of this, right? And yeah. Bashar al-Assad is still there. So uh, realistic positions are much more, uh, are smart diplomatic positions. Unrealistic positions sometimes, even though you might have good objectives, uh, as you may want to tell the world, uh, mostly don't hold. Okay. Uh, that was uh, Ms. Hina Rabani Kar talking to the former Foreign Minister of Pakistan. Thank you so much for being on the program. Let me now go to Ubaida Hitto. Uh, Ubaida, you obviously someone who knows the ground situation very well. Just walk us through this, because this is obviously now a wicked problem. And a wicked problem, by definition, is extremely complex and not very easy to deal with. So just walk us through this. So, so the war in Syria has been going on now for, uh, this is the eighth year. There's more than half a million people dead. There's more than half a million people. There's untold numbers of people who have been injured and displaced from their homes. There's six million people displaced inside the country and another several million displaced outside of the country, totaling 11 million people who have been forced out of their homes to places that aren't familiar to them and trying to struggle to regroup their families and put their lives back together. So as your guest very clearly explained, the situation is extremely complicated. Different people have different interests. But in the end, the the, the the conflict itself grew out of a public effort to bring light to the oppression and the injustice that was going on in Syria. People were fed up with the way the government was treating people. This is a, a, a nepotistic government, government that has been inherited from father to son. The father, Hafez al-Assad, came to power through a, a military coup and then managed to uh, create the Ba'ath Party and create the, the, the Ba'ath Party as the, the core of the government and the military. And it's been run through the military and through intelligence and security forces since that time, since the 60s. And Bashar al-Assad inherited that system, and he and he continued in the same way. He didn't change policies. He was made out to be a reformer in the years leading up to the Arab Spring in 2011 when uh, the conflict started in Syria. But the truth is that he wasn't a reformer at all. The, his background of being a, a medically trained doctor who came from Britain and his wife he met in Britain also, coming from a Sunni family, this kind of gave them a cosmopolitan look uh, to the public inside Syria and the Western audience, but the, the, the fact remains that this is a dictatorial regime and it imprisons people against their will, it tortures people to death, it kills people indiscriminately with airstrikes and bombings and gas attacks and chemical attacks and using uh, weapons that are banned by international law. So th there's a fine line to draw here w w when we talk about whether he's fit to rule or not fit to rule I in the sense that if Bashar al-Assad, uh, you know, deserves to still be the president of Syria. Now the conflict is moving into a phase where people are getting tired of war, but there are groups uh, who uh, are, are basically thriving on the war. There are groups who are basically, uh, there are groups who actually emerged in the war because of the conflict, the armed nature of the conflict, like the militia that came from different parts of the world, including Pakistan, to Syria to fight to defend Bashar al-Assad for ideological reasons, not necessarily because of you know any kind of political motivation, but pure ideological uh, motivations or even financial motivations. The recruitment of mercenaries has become uh, something that's a commonplace, uh, uh, commonplace in the Syrian conflict. Uh, people are being paid to come and fight in Syria to defend Bashar al-Assad. Now that the Russians and the Iranians have spent the last three years to shore up the regime's defenses in the sense that they've given the regime manpower, they've given the regime money, they've given the regime heavy equipment, they've given the regime even air cover. The Russians have provided the regime's air support for the past three years of the conflict without fail. They've even attacked 
other international countries or basically defended against attacks from international countries on behalf of the Syrian government. So now you have the Russians, you know, uh, by proxy defending the Syrian airspace and the Iranians by proxy uh, defending the Syrian ground. And th- th- there is a very convoluted situation uh, developing in terms of finding a political solution. Recently, the groups, they went to Astana, uh, Russia, Iran, and Turkey have started this process, and they've made some success in terms of establishing uh, a demilitarized zone in Idlib. Before that, they established four uh, uh, de-conflicted zones, uh, de-escalation zones is what they called them. Uh, But eventually, we saw that the regime in the three de-escalation zones that don't exist anymore, the regime was able to continue its airstrikes using the pretext of attacking terrorists who uh, they didn't agree with whether they were terrorists or not with the other parties involved in the Astana agreement. So they cleared out Homs, they cleared out Dara, they cleared out Guta of Damascus, all of the opposition fighters, whether we agree on who is a terrorist or not, was forced out of there. But, but that's, the that's, a, that's a very important distinction, Obeda. You would agree with me because, as I said, the situation now is very complex. Uh, on this note, I must also introduce uh, my other guest here, uh, Satare uh, Sadiqi, uh, who's a political analyst from Iran, has also joined us. But, Ubeda, here's the thing. Uh, Of course, there are uh, state and non-state parties that are supporting Bashar al-Assad, but equally there are state parties that are supporting the groups that are operating against uh, Bashar al-Assad. So uh, this is something which, and you also talked about the fact that some of the groups have emerged uh, because of the conflict, and now, of course, there is a conflict economy uh, that's, uh, that's, that exists in Syria. Now, given this, I want to ask you some, uh, uh, an interesting question about if you were to go back to 2011 in the wake of the Arab Spring and when the political opposition began asking for more rights in Syria, with this hindsight, if you were to go back, would you think that it was, it, it was a good idea to take up arms against Bashar al-Assad or would the political opposition have taken a different route? The Syrian opposition and people who were involved in the Syrian uh, uh, revolution and conflict since the beginning are asking themselves this. The, the answer to that question is probably not going to get us, us anywhere. Even if we said, and if we wanted to say that the... The decision to take up arms against Bashar al-Assad was a bad strategy uh, in order to create some kind of political change in Syria. It's something that's uh, behind us, done and dusted, because now we have countries like Iran. These are not non-state actors like Russia, like America, like Turkey that are on the ground inside Syria. Syria. The, the, The actual geography of Syria has changed due to the presence of these countries inside Syria. Could the Syrian opposition have stopped this in 2011, if they decided not to take up arms? I don't think so, because I believe that this is some kind of, uh, how you say, uh, there are, as our guest previously, the former minister mentioned, there are parties involved with specific interests and who had very big plans in terms of the geopolitical makeup of the region and wanted to achieve specific things. And the the situation is still developing, so we're not reaching the end of it yet. Okay, I'm, I'm going to come to that made... because because she talked about uh, real politics, and that's uh, that's a very important issue here. But let me pull in uh, Satare Siddiqui. Uh, welcome to the program, Ms. Siddiqui. Uh, you were hearing Ada Hittu uh, talk about the situation in Syria and uh, the Iranian role, the the oppression that was unleashed by uh, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, give us a perspective on the Iranian position uh, as far as uh, this issue is concerned. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. So, uh, I would like to start uh, with uh, um, replying to uh, your other guest uh, uh, Hitu, comments yes. on the yeah. involvement of um, Iran uh, versus like uh, Turkey and other countries in the uh, Syrian conflict. Um, and you pose a very good question. Uh, would it be a good idea to um, support those terrorist groups who oppose the um, government of Bashar al-Assad uh, if we go back to 2011? Um, I think the answer is very clear. If you take the uh, humanitarian uh, crisis that has um, emerged in Syria. 
uh, of course, it would be the worst option always to take up uh, arms uh, to oppose um, a government which has been elected by the people and which has a representative in the United Nations. I may not or may be um, in favor of the government, but it does not concern me if, uh, I mean, the people of Syria have to decide. No one had the right to um, and get involved in Syria. Uh, but, Ms. Siddiqui, the, the issue here is the issue here is that the system in Syria was not configured in a way which would genuinely uh, get the expression of the people of Syria. And the entire thing started because the people of Syria wanted Bashar al-Assad to go and to open up the system. Yes, I understand that there were uh, opposition groups, there were um, civilians, there were a Syrian population who were against Bashar al-Assad. But when a, re when a government uh, has a system accepted by the United Nations, if you want to help uh, the opposition groups, you have to be very careful who you are funding, who you are supporting. If it's uh, some unarmed um, opposition groups, okay, then go for it and support them. But when you know that they are Al-Qaeda affiliates, they are terrorist groups who have uh, shed the blood of Syrian people, you're not helping the nation. You are actually helping those who are uh, looking for political benefits out of this crisis. And that's my point. Uh, um, I do not, uh, I mean, who am I to say that I support or I do not support uh, the government of Bashar al-Assad? It's uh, upon the uh, Syrian people to decide. But if Syria, if Iran and uh, Russia are in Syria, it has been upon the uh, formal invitation of the government in that country, which has a representative in the United Nations. But what about Turkey? What about uh, United States? And I have to add also that Turkey is a part of NATO. And of course, they are looking for uh, fulfilling the interest of uh, the larger group that they are representing. And just as we were talking today, there were attacks by the U.S.-led uh, coalition in, uh, in some parts of um, Syria. And who are, who are the people who are being attacked by those uh, coalition? They are the Syrian okay, people. so, so, so where we started, uh, let me just uh, fill you in on that, uh, about the constitutional committee talks in Astana that failed between Turkey, Iran, and Russia. Now, uh, give us a sense of what the Iranian position on that is, because obviously uh, this is part of a peace process or a peace initiative, which is also being supported by the United Nations. So... What is the problem there now as far as the Constitutional Committee is concerned? Uh, I think just as um, the Russian and the Turkish, the, sorry, Syrian um, representatives have been uh, stating after the conference, uh, Turkey is not really helping the um, initiatives uh, for the peace talks go smooth. Um, Turkey is... Uh, still supporting some um, uh, opposition groups which are not moderate. And um, you know that uh, when the Astana talks started, um, Turkey, uh, like during the process, uh, Turkey was also invited to uh, help the pre-peace process by um, uh, working as an in intermediary between the opposition groups and the Syrian government. Um, and uh, the Syrian government allowed for that, uh, but made an ex uh, exclusion, which was made an exception, which was the um, not uh, moderate opposition groups. So mm -hmm. the problem now is that, um, as you know, there are opposition groups, modern uh, moderate uh, opposition groups involved in the Syrian uh, peace talks, in, as going in uh, Astana. Um, but there are other opposition groups which are not moderate and which have been okay. affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Yeah, yeah, the, problem, the problem is that it's very difficult to, because uh, several state actors are unfortunately sponsoring several other non-state actors. But let me get a quick word from Ubeda on this because I have also to wrap up. Ubeda, you want to uh, put in uh, your, uh, your word uh, on this constitutional committee issue? 
But my issue with the Astana process and the way I, I see it is that this process is is basically hinged on to UN Resolution 2254. Whether it's Iran or Russia or Turkey as a guarantor in Astana, the entire process is dependent on it meeting the standards and meeting the, uh, the, the requirements of UN 2254. UN 2254 puts out a, a, a clear plan on transition, transitioning away from Bashar al-Assad at the head of the government, transitioning away from the war through the formation of a constitutional committee made up of people from both the government and the opposition yeah. and the multiple other parties that have a political interest in Syria and also a, a, a transition through an open and free election that's observed and verified by the international community. Bashar al-Assad, Iran and Russia, they're not interested in sitting down at the table with the opposition and going through this process any way that Russia and Iran, in my opinion, can keep this process out of the UN Resolution 2254 basket, this will be a good thing for them because they can delay any kind of international binding decision that would force them to leave Syria because the Syrian government and Iran continue to say that Iran was asked formally by the Syrian government in Damascus to come on its behest. And the Russians argue the same thing. So they don't feel like they need to leave. They don't feel like they're an, uh, a foreign uh, uh, occupying force that they refer to some other uh, forces inside Syria that are international okay. in, in nature. So okay. th th there, there is a kind of, there, there is a, a, you know, a way, a, a misrepresentation about the roles of the international actors in Syria and in the Astana and the UN okay, Obada, process. Okay, uh, Obada, I think that's all the time I have this. Um, clearly, uh, Satara Siddiqui and Obada Hittu, uh, have different perspectives on on the situation, which of course is legitimate in the because the situation is wicked. But thank you to Satare Siddiqui and Obeda Hitu for being part of the program and in giving us a sense of what the ground situation is and how complex it is. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we will discuss our second story of the day, which relates to. Yemen and the situation in Yemen. Stay with us. Welcome back to Indus Special. We are now going to discuss the situation in Yemen. Yemen's warring parties have suggested that they would attend a UN-sponsored peace talks expected to be held in Sweden next week as Western countries press for an end to a conflict that has pushed millions to the edge of starvation. The United Nations is trying to reconvene talks between the Saudi-backed government led by Mansoor Hadi and the Iranian-aligned Houthis who control much of the north to agree on a framework for peace. A previous attempt to hold talks in Geneva in September collapsed when the Houthis failed to show up, accusing their adversaries of obstruction. And for this, for this we have with us Ambassador Najmuddin Sheikh, who's also a former foreign secretary of Pakistan, and Yusuf Arim, who's a political analyst based in Istanbul. Kick off with uh, Mr. Sheikh. Uh, how do you view the situation, uh, Ambassador Sheikh, given that this is now a very complex problem? Now, the one redeeming feature, the one hopeful feature is uh, that uh, the UN uh, mediator has been able to secure agreement and has been able to guarantee that 55 Houthis will be treated abroad, that there will be money made available for, uh, vet, uh, for uh, uh, purchasing more food, uh, which the Saudis have donated, and that uh, the Saudis themselves, I think, are now looking at uh, a way of... Uh, uh, getting out of uh, uh, Yemen, uh, since there has been a, a stalemated situation there for very long. Uh, enormous amounts of money have been spent, and even more importantly, enormous damage has been done to uh, Saudi reputation and Saudi good name uh, internationally, and particularly in the West, uh, with whom uh, Saudi Arabia is, of course, anxious to maintain good relations. So I think that there are prospects, but... Uh, uh, to suggest that uh, the talks will uh, almost immediately result in, in uh, uh, an agreement uh, is perhaps uh, hoping for too much. But what we can hope for is that the embargo will be lifted and that uh, the port will be free to receive uh, shipments of food and aid 
uh, that uh, uh, NGOs are prepared to provide, and particularly with the United Nations being in the lead on this particular How subject. much of this do you think has anything to do with the setback that Riyadh has had uh, with reference to the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi? Obviously, that has been a, 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 an, an important factor. But I think also important has been the fact that this has dragged on for a long time. And had uh, the Khashoggi uh, thing not happened, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia would still found itself under a, a certain amount of pressure. Uh, in fact, even before the Khashoggi thing happened, uh, the U.S. Congress was making noises about uh, yes. uh, persuading... Intelligence sharing and, and obviously uh, giving weapons and ammunition to the Saudis. That's right. And, and that uh, the Congress was threatening to cut this off. Yeah. Uh, this process of cutting off had started in the Obama period, had then been eclipsed by uh, President Trump's uh, 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 embrace of uh, Saudi yeah. Arabia. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, here and after, I think uh, uh, the uh, administration's point of view, I think uh, administration point of view echoed by Pompeo and, uh, and uh, Mattis has been that now it's time for uh, uh, Saudi Arabia to try and mitigate the impact of Khashoggi by doing things in Yemen that may uh, give them some respite from the uh, attacks to which they've been uh, subjected in, in the international press and in international public opinion generally. Ambassador Sheikh, stay with me. Uh, I just want to go to uh, Yusuf Aaron. Uh, who keeps a very close watch on Yemen. Uh, Yusuf, can you just walk us through this? Uh, what are the prospects now? Is, is this some kind of opening? Well, I definitely think that the resolution that passed in the U.S. Senate, Senate uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, 63 to 37, I believe, which shows great bipartisan support, support between the Republicans and the Democrats is a very important step in setting the backdrop ahead of the Stockholm meetings, uh, December 3rd to December 13th. Now the Houthis guaranteeing that they're gonna come and the Saudi-backed Hadi government go going to be represented is also very important. As you stated earlier, there were talks scheduled in September, but the Houthis did not show up. Now we're seeing a lot of pressure on MBS as the honorable ambassador uh, stated earlier, there's an incredible amount of pressure on MBS. Uh, MBS taking steps to end the suffering in Yemen could be a way out for him with the Khashoggi affair. Now, now there's a lot of pressure in the U.S. to remove MBS. There's a lot of pressure to sanction him, uh, not just in the U.S., in the U.K., in France, the EU, globally. So uh, moving towards peace in Yemen could be a good move for MBS strategically to secure his political survival going forward. Now, we're seeing a lot of world leaders uh, stating that they're going to meet with MBS at the G20 meetings that are taking place right now in Argentina. Yeah. So MBS is using this uh, issue very well to provide a platform where world leaders can still talk to him, regardless of that big cloud of murder in the Khashoggi case hanging over his head. So I expect a lot more development in these meetings going forward because Saudi Arabia is going to want to use the Yemen issue to help clean up its image, which was severely damaged by the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul. Yeah, that's a very important insight. Uh, tell, uh, tell us, uh, do you think that this is uh, the kind of quid that MBS is looking for to get the quo, which is essentially that... You know, this entire thing about somehow pushing him out does not happen. So he gives in on what now people have been demanding vis-a-vis -vis Yemen uh, in trying to secure himself uh, at home. Well, there's a lot of problems. It's not just Yemen. We have to also talk about the Qatar blockade as well. That's yeah. an issue that needs to be solved. But Yemen is a much more dire situation right now with a humanitarian disaster uh, disease, uh, illness, catastrophe going on in the nation. But definitely, uh, there has been a lot of talk uh, d domestically as well. The, there was a Reuters report just a couple weeks ago that there's mm. growing domestic opposition to MBS. Mm. There are, uh, many of the uh, senior princes are not happy with the way MBS mm. is uh, mm. taking, a, uh, taking a foreign policy of Saudi Arabia, and he's uh, out of control. So 
it's very, very important. And I believe that the United States and many other countries can use this damage done by the Khashoggi affair to push MBS towards peace in Yemen, regardless of whether him wanting it right now or not. But there's, there's definitely a lot of scrutiny now on everything Saudi Arabia does, uh, whether it be the Qatar blockade, whether it be Yemen, as I said, whether it be its treatment of uh, the women activists for, uh, who petitioned for driving rights, uh, them being tortured, uh, their moves in Syria. So MBS is walking on eggshells. Now he is facing is definitely... And hopefully we're going to be seeing positive steps next week in stock. Okay. Since you mentioned, since you mentioned women and also uh, we were talking about the humanitarian crisis, uh, we have been joined by Kokab al Thebani, uh, who is a Yemeni journalist and human rights activist, uh, knows uh, the ground situation in Yemen, has reported from there and is currently in self-exile. Uh, thank you for being on the program, uh, Ms. al Thebani. Uh, give us a sense of the humanitarian dimension of this crisis. Uh, what exactly are we looking at? Uh, clearly, there, are, there have been a number of UN reports and other independent reports about displacements and starvation and various other ailments like cholera and the rest. Uh, is this something which uh, needs to be looked at uh, immediately, is this uh, uh, the Swedish talks are going to be a good opening towards some kind of restoration of peace and, and normalcy? Um, thank you so much. Um, of course, Yemen now is in a deteriorating situation. And I know from some friends that they're going to declare Yemen to be famine soon. And even if it's not declared famine, there are many people who are already living this. So I know technicality according to you, and you cannot declare it, but actually people are living in, in famine. And every, in each 10 minutes, there is a child dying. So I don't think there's another reason to push for more efforts to end the war in Yemen as, as possible as we can. But also I want to intervene, so because there is a lack of understanding of the Yemeni context, that there is a lot of focus on the Saudi, and we agree on this. But unfortunately, the Khashoggi case has a good side and a bad side. The good side is that it has showed the Saudi-led coalition its bad performance in Yemen. But the, on the other side, it has diminished the role of the Houthi backed by Iran. There are two sides in Yemen meddling in their affairs, and they have been affecting the peace process as well. So if we want to look at the Saudi as well, we need to look also at the Iran-backed groups who are not even holding the Yemeni true demands as well. With this as well, we need also to push for more involvement of women in this regard. So we are trying to push for at least 30% of all women. So you can understand this context and you understand the imminent issues that women need in the, the country and people on the ground need to know. Okay, so, so going beyond obviously the good wishes and clearly given the crisis, uh, anyone would say that there should be peace. But if we go back to the roots of the conflict and the failure of a political transition supposed to bring stability to Yemen following the Arab Spring uprising and, and the rest, as you know, now there are a number of groups. You've got the separatists, you've got uh, the Al-Qaeda people, you've got the Houthis, uh, you have uh, the Saudi-backed coalition, uh, and now also uh, a sort of... Uh, chasm between how the UAE looks at Yemen and how Saudi Arabia is looking at Yemen. How in real terms, because the devil lies in the details, how is it going to happen? Is there a possibility that this can happen? Because now there are so many vested interests. This is exactly what I have told you. There is a lack of understanding in the context of Yemen. Um, the transitional justice has been, the transitional period has failed because of the GCC brokered initiative that has given immunity to the previous regime, which has intervened into and has led to the deterioration of this transitional justice, a uh, transitional uh, period, I mean. So, and, and if you look at, the, if you go back and look at the history of Yemen, you see the UN resolutions have condemned clearly the spoilers of this period. So that's why we need to understand and look and, and work with the people on the ground. There is a possibility if you work on local governance, there are some governance 
running themselves. So you don't need to work with the government or the Houthi per se. What you need to do is to stop the war. But also you try to empower the So firstly, government. we would need a ceasefire. Before anything else can be worked out, the first thing is that uh, the war should stop. There should be ceasefire along the multiple lines where the groups are fighting each other. Fire, and there has, we have to end the blockade, air, naval, and board. And we have also to stop the siege on Taiz that has been going on for three years by the Houthi, and this has not been highlighted in the media. And the, every day, a person and a child die there because of the dangerous routes they have to take. So okay, okay, stay with, stay, with me, stay with me a, a little longer. I want to take this to Ambassador Sheikh. Uh, Ambassador Sheikh, you, you're hearing, uh, you know, experts who follow Yemen very closely. Um, do you think that the first and the foremost uh, requirement uh, is the necessary, though not sufficient condition, but the necessary condition is a ceasefire? Uh, absolutely. Look... Uh, what I've heard, uh, and partic particularly Madame's uh, view of what the situation on the ground is in terms of the famine conditions, in terms of the children who are dying, at ten, and ten minutes a child dies, uh, millions of uh, now uh, across the, the international press pictures have appeared of malnourished, stunted children uh, with uh, all their bones showing and virtually no life in their eyes. This is, this is a humanitarian crisis, uh, and the reaction to the humanitarian crisis must be that first, stop the fighting, let food and supplies enter the country so that this can be addressed. Thereafter, the complexities of the situation include, uh, I think, uh, uh, elements other than those which have been mentioned, is the fact that uh, the south of uh, Yemen, Aden and its immediate environment, is uh, really now virtually entirely under the control of the UAE uh, forces and their local partners. Okay. You mentioned the Al-Qaeda, you mentioned uh, the Houthis. You have to take account of the fact that uh, the Houthis were allies of Saleh when yes. he was ruling. Yes. And now these are, these are but then they ended up killing him because, yeah, okay. What I'm trying to tell you is that the internal complexities of the situation are one element. The fact that Saudi Arabia has a large Yemeni uh, population, uh, yeah. uh, including families like uh, Osama bin Laden's family or uh, yeah, the uh, the family. Bin Laden yeah. family. Yeah. Now, these are all elements that uh, play into this in a different way. But the foremost con concern right now for the world must be to stop, to put an end to the humanitarian crisis, okay. to get food like, yeah. and uh, supplies to the people of Yemen. Yeah. And then I think you cannot expect, I, 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 I genuinely believe that the UAE's control of Aden and of uh, their, their local partners, and their local partners are all Yemenis, yeah. uh, perhaps southern Yen Yemenis if you wish to call them that, but they are there and they will have, uh, want a more direct role uh, than uh, will be assigned to them in terms of the UN uh, agreement where the principal focus is on the provisional government or the, the government recognized, uh, Hadi government and uh, the, uh, the recognized uh, Al-Qaeda threat and the recognized Houthi uh, position. There are many more elements involved and all those elements will come into play. But the first thing, as you said, was a ceasefire, supplies coming in, and then these complexities will be worked out as in all such negotiations over the years. This is not going to happen overnight. This is not going to happen in a year. This is going to happen over a longer period. But the humanitarian, the, the suffering of the Yemeni people must be brought to an end as soon as possible. I think, that, we, are, I think, I think we are agreed on this. Uh, Yusuf, are we uh, at this table agreed on the fact the necessary, though not sufficient condition, is to have a ceasefire? And then for the UN and other interested parties to sit down with the stakeholders in Yemen to work out uh, multiple compromises. Definitely, uh, for there to be Im important peace talks, uh, peace talks where we can build on going forward, we first need a ceasefire. The fighting has to stop because under these conditions, uh, we can't have positive peace talks. The, there was a resolution brought to the United Nations just a week or two ago by the UK 
calling for an immediate ceasefire and opening of humanitarian aid channels. And unfortunately, members of the Security Council, including the United States, shot that uh, shot the resolution down, mm. which could have set a very mm. important tone for the UN-sponsored uh, peace talks in Stockholm. Now, why are the why is the United States shooting down a UK-sponsored stop the a ceasefire and humanitarian aid bill? I, I still don't understand that. A according to reports in the international media, there's been a lot of Saudi lobbying, a lot of UAE lobbying going on. So uh, on one side, they look like they're trying to work for peace in Yemen. But on the other side, they're shooting down UN resolutions that would uh, bring an immediate ceasefire as well. So. There's a lot of two-faced dealing going on, but I do agree with both guests. An immediate ceasefire and opening of humanitarian aid is in everyone's best interest right now because no one wants a humanitarian disaster. War is bad enough without affecting the civilians this much. Ab absolutely. But let me go back to uh, Ms. Al-Sebani with, with another question. Uh, do you think this also opens up space for the separatists uh, who would want to, uh, the merger, they would want to be separate as far as Yemen is concerned because obviously there was a merger between South and the North. Do you think this will open up space for them? Also, the, the issue of the South, South is also one of the results of the war. So if the root causes of the war have been addressed, I think the separation should be addressed as well as one of these issues as well. So um, the South issue has been neglected, marginalized, and some of the people have the right to speak about this. And it's, 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 it's not clear if this is going to happen or not. But we believe if we include their calls in any peace agreement or any talks, this will give them a kind of, um, what we say, um, a kind of reassurance that their cases have been addressed. Okay. Uh, that was Kokob al Thebani. Thank you for uh, being with me on the, on the program. Let me go back to Ambassador Sheikh. Uh, Ambassador Sheikh, uh, let's assume that the ceasefire happens. Let's also assume that then there is space for the state parties and the United Nations to come in and get the stakeholders to start talking. That still leaves out groups like Al-Qaeda and IS because clearly they are not going to come to a negotiating table. Uh, no, you know, what is, uh, uh, even when there is, there is a ceasefire, there will be the uh, understanding uh, that intelligence-based operations against uh, uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS, uh, the ISIS presence, in my view, is uh, relatively It's not very small. significant, yeah. Yeah, in, uh, in, uh, in Yemen. But that uh, the intelligence-based operations, uh, the uh, air flights, the drones will continue. I think that that will be one of the things that will be part of the... But will, 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 will that operation be under some kind of UN resolution? Uh, I, um, I'm not... Uh, well, I think that the current operation is... Uh, the current uh, uh, activities that the Americans have undertaken in this particular regard do not have uh, a UN resolution Correct. backing. Yeah. None of, the, none of the, the drone operations are likely uh, to... And backing, and in any case, this is the sort of thing on which uh, many uh, members of the Security Council would be very chary of uh, granting approval and yeah. uh, uh, creating a precedent. Especially so in is, the absence uh, of any particular sovereign government in Yemen. Yes, well, I'm, I'm not sure uh, that uh, actually, actually, I think uh, the American drone operations uh, are carried out with. Uh, cooperation from local operatives, many of them associated with uh, with the government, with uh, the uh, government recognized government. Mm -hmm. So uh, that that sort of thing will continue. It was it, there even during Saleh's time. That was the sort of cooperation that uh, the Americans were receiving from whoever was in charge, uh, or mm -hmm. theoretically in charge, or uh, or uh, uh, recognized legally as being in charge. That that sort of cooperation was always uh, uh, done under this uh, sort of uh, rubric that uh, the the government is uh, is uh, uh, prepared to help us with this and that we are not operating without that sort of legal cover. But that's uh, you know I, I think that uh, the impact on the ceasefire should be relatively small because uh, uh, 
uh, even though many of the restrictions on drone warfare have been uh, reduced by uh, by President Trump in other cases, uh, I think uh, there is still uh, a possibility, given the location of the Al Qaeda forces, uh, that these can uh, be carried out with a minimal uh, civilian loss of life. But again, I'm not sufficiently familiar with the terrain to be able to state this uh, categorically. Uh, but I think in the past there have not been very, very many reports with regard to uh, civilian casualties uh, as a result of uh, drone attacks. Drone attacks. But Yusuf is clearly uh, familiar with the terrain and the situation on the ground. Uh, so uh, before I wrap up, I, I want uh, you to uh, give us a sense of what kind of steps are required for a more lasting peace even before we, we and we're not talking about the the resolution. We're not talking about who is actually going to uh, be in the government. But the first one is obviously ceasefire. But what other steps to ensure that the ceasefire uh, remains and that the various parties can work on? Uh, I'm assuming multiple compromises that can then lead to the the big compromise. Well, when we look at Yemen right now, let's say there was a ceasefire and the peace talks were successful. I think one of the most important things going forward is a quick normalization of everyday life. Now, uh, as the honorable ambassador was stating that he didn't believe Daesh was a big threat, I, I agree with him. Al-Qaeda is much more important in Yemen, I think. And these types of groups, they thrive on chaos and they thrive on power vacuums. So yeah. the power vacuums need to be filled. And I think one of the most important things the UN could do if uh, peace is reached is they need to deploy peacemakers. Uh, there needs to be law and order established. A law, an order, a judiciary, <laughs> everyday life needs to uh, fall into line. And when everyday life falls into line and these power vacuums are filled, it leaves very little room to operate for these non-state actors going forward. Now, when we look at Yemen and we look at 2011, uh, one of the reasons why was we had the, uh, the, the Arab Spring sparked in Yemen was the breakaway between the left and the conservative right. So obviously, uh, obviously a kind of new, new revamped, redeveloped constitution will be necessary. Uh, obviously, voting will be necessary going forward where the Yemeni people can actually elect a government. But until we get to there, peace a peacekeeping force, a return to everyday life, a return to the judiciary, to law and order. Uh, people need to eat. People need to not worry about where their next meal is coming from. And like I said, once everything becomes normalized and these power vacuums are filled, these non-state actors become less and less of a threat going forward. Okay, so uh, ceasefire and then uh, I'm assuming a, a peacekeeping force and I think the irony is that they probably want a peacekeeping force uh, that does not have soldiers from uh, the Saudi-led coalition, which has actually waged a war in Yemen. So we're talking about uh, other troops. And Parties. then, of course, some kind of provisional government uh, supervised by the United Nations. Definitely. A provisional government, at least uh, somebody who can prepare the day-to-day -day workings and the duties that a government is supposed to put forth until Yemen is culturally, socially, and economically ready to hold a, to have a election. Okay, uh, Ambassador Sheikh, anything else you want to add to this before I wrap up? Yes, well, I, I just wanted to, you know, a, a very important point was raised as to whether this in itself is going to be sufficient to mitigate uh, the impact of uh, Khashoggi and whether there will need to be movement with regard to the restoration of the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, and its original membership. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that it is likely to happen, uh, but that is an, an important side issue, uh, which has largely been eclipsed by uh, Yemen, but which will also need to be addressed if there is supposed to be a, a semblance of stability in the region. Okay. Uh, Saudi Arabia has talked about the fact that there are missiles being launched and that those missiles are uh, hitting targets. Uh, some are being uh, uh, countered by the Patriot missiles that they have, but some are apparently getting through. So this, is, uh, this again, okay. requires that the Gulf Cooperation Council should return to its original membership and be a party 
to uh, making sure that uh, the Yemen that the region can be stabilized, be including Yemen. Thank you so much, Ambassador Muddin Sheikh, uh, Yusuf Aram, for being with us and explaining to us uh, the situation in Yemen and the necessary, though not sufficient, condition of a ceasefire before uh, one can go on to getting the various stakeholders to sit at the table and start making those compromises. This is all from us for today. We'll see you next week. Until then, goodbye.